that I picked up just to stimulate my thinking is a very slim volume written by Watchman Nee entitled Sit, Walk, Stand. And some of you obviously know it by the um, nodding of your heads. And it's a very, it's a very slim book and it obviously doesn't go through the, uh, the book of Ephesians in any great detail. What Watchman Nee does is he picks out uh, those three key words in Ephesians, sit, walk, stand, and shows how they apply uh, to our Christian life. And what I want to do this afternoon is just use one of those words, and it's the word sit. Because as um, I hope you'll uh, perceive, it flows in very much with what Dan has been sharing uh, both last night and this morning. Those two messages obviously uh, very much go together. I mean, in a, in, in a sense, they are the same message, uh, but using different scriptures and with a different emphasis. But that, that, that whole concept of allowing God to do what he wants to do in our lives and us standing back. Colin was uh, sharing uh, or a few weeks ago in one of the occasions when he was speaking how in a meeting he said to... Um, uh, God, what do I do now? I'm not exactly sure what was going on in the meeting, uh, but he'd probably been preaching and he'd come to that uh, part of the, uh, the time where there was the possibility of, worship, of ministry, worship, uh, praying for one another and so on. And he turned around to God and said, Lord, what do I do now? And the Lord said to him, get out of the way. Uh, and uh, it's one of these words, you know, that's uh, pretty unmistakable and speaks very powerfully. Now, it's that theme uh, that in one sense has been coming through uh, this revival conference that we've been sharing together. And it's that word, as you'll see as we go on, it's that word sitting, or if you like, if you prefer, resting. And I don't mean by that resting in the spirit in the sense of being horizontal in the floor, on the floor, but resting in the Lord that enables God to do what he wants to do in our lives. Now, if we ask the question, what is God's purpose for us? What is God's purpose for our churches? What is God's purpose for our ministry? We can, um, we can articulate that in all sorts of different ways. We can think, for example, immediate verses like John 10.10, I have come that you might have life and life in abundance. And we know that the, the, uh, the first part of that verse says the enemy comes to steal and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and life in abundance. And it's one of those verses that immediately comes to mind and in one sense verbalizes in a nice sort of pithy, uh, neat way what God wants to do in our lives and also in our ministries and also in our churches. I, if you were here on Tuesday night, I was sharing that word that God spoke to me uh, just a week ago in relation to the college. And God said that the vision... Uh, for the college, obviously is revival, obviously is faith, all these key words that are, that are part of this ministry. But um, as I was sharing, I'm always asking God to, to keep it fresh. And it's the same vision, but it needs to come fresh. And the, uh, the phrase, those four words the Lord gave me, realizing your full potential. And that's another phrase that we could use, that what God wants to do in our lives is that we realize our full potential in the spirit, in all that God wants to do in us and through us. Now, another concept, and this comes back to this uh, commentary that um, Watchman Nee uh, wrote on Ephesians and those three words, another word that we can use is the word that God wants us to stand in him. Or put it another way, God wants us to stand as Christians in the world. I've been doing a series this uh, term on Tuesday evenings with the students on, uh, if you have any theological training, you'll know it under the word eschatology. Uh, if you don't know that word, it's about all the end times, the return of Christ and the events that lead up to the return of Christ. Um, and the rapture and the judgment and heaven and hell, all, all that sort of subject. 
It's something that I've never taught on before, and um, therefore it's involved quite a lot of study. And certain things have come out uh, that have surprised me. One of the things that's come out that surprised me is the severity of the persecution that is going to take place um, against Christians before Christ returns. I mean, I'd always been aware of that, but I'd never really noticed the, the verses that speak and teach about that, and the verses that speak about the severity of that persecution. Some of you will know there's a verse in Revelation which says that Jesus is actually, or, or God rather, is actually going to bring those days to a quick conclusion, because if he doesn't, there won't be any Christians left. Uh, verses in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 where it says many will turn away and another verse where it says most will lose their love for the Lord. Now that's quite awesome and it's quite challenging and as I've been doing this study um, it's something that's impacted me in a way that I'd never really noticed before how the severity of the persecution is going to be so great uh, that many Christians are going to turn away. I read a statistic um, some months ago about the number of people that were being martyred in the world per year. And I checked this statistic out and um, my um, limited research came, brought me to the conclusion that the statistic was probably over pitched but not by very much. And as statistics are, it's a few years out of date. The, the figure that I was reading this year was of what was happening two or three years ago. Um, and what was happening this year probably won't be known until two or three years hence. That's the nature of that sort of study. But it was an astonishing figure. And the figure that I read was that in one year, and I'm going back now about two or three years, in the world, approximately 300,000 people had lost their lives for Jesus. Now I just could not believe that figure. 300,000 in a year. And I did some checking up um, um, with some of the uh, missionary organizations and people involved in uh, Christian research and, and uh, you'll know that uh, there are people who bring out these statistics about the church and you know, they're pretty reliable. The, 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 the evidence suggests that they, they've got their figures about right. And the figure was downgraded to 250,000. That's still a quarter of a million people martyred for the name of Jesus in a year. Now, I just found that absolutely incredible. Countries like the Sudan, for, Sudan was probably the worst country in the world. Some of you will know that the, uh, the uh, Arabs in the north with their uh, Muslim faith and the Negroes in the south with their Christian faith and there is a civil war that's been going on in the Sudan between the north and the south and has been for many, many years and people in the south are being crucified. People are being martyred by the hundreds of thousands every year. Now you think about that for a moment and you realize that any persecution that we have in this country is, is insignificant by comparison. Now what the Bible tells us is that before the end times that persecution is going to become more severe. So severe that God is going to have to bring it short. He's going to have to shorten it else there would be no Christian left. Now what is the challenge for Christians in that situation? Well, the challenge, we can express it in lots of different ways, but one of the challenges is that we stand. We stand. We stand as children of God. We stand upright for the faith. We stand in our declaration of the truth. We stand in our proclamation of the gospel. We stand whatever the enemy throws at us. The emphasis of this commentary that Watchman Nee uh, wrote was that we can't stand unless we are walking with God. You can't stand as a child of God unless you are walking as a child of God. You can't stand as a child of God unless you are walking with God. 
But you can't walk with God unless you are sitting with God. Hence the, um, I won't, we won't take time to go through Ephesians and, uh, and do a study on it, uh, but hence the, uh, the three words, sit, walk, stand. God calls us to stand. But you can't stand unless you're walking with him. It stands to reason. If we're not walking with God, then we're not likely to stand against that persecution that will come. But the key thing, and this is the area which I think will surprise, it certainly surprised me when I thought about this and maybe surprise uh, some of us, we can't walk unless we're sitting with him. Now, let's just look at this in a little more detail. If you turn to Ephesians, we'll just look at a couple of scriptures just to um, earth this in the word. Ephesians 1 and let me read from verse 18. Ephesians 1 and verse 18. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Where is Jesus at this moment? We often talk about Jesus being here amongst us, in our midst. Well, there's a sense in which that's true. But if we think about it for a moment more accurately, Jesus is seated with God in the heavenly realms, and it's from that position that one day he will return. So who is here in our midst, of course? Well, it's the spirit of Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. The New Testament uses all those phrases. And so Jesus is here by his Holy Spirit. But there's a sense in which Jesus at this moment is not working on earth. And there's a sense in which Jesus is seated with God in heaven. So who is working on earth? Well, the dynamic of God on earth is the Holy Spirit. And it's from that position, that seated position, that Jesus is one day, one day going to return. And if you hold a pre-millennium view, you'll know that Jesus is going to return and there's going to be the rapture and we're going to reign with him for a thousand years on earth before that final culmination and we all go to be with him for eternity in glory. Anyway, that's another subject and I will resist the temptation to get into that. Turn to chapter 2 and verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ. And what has he done with us? He has seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And it's this word that Watchman Nee picks up in his commentary and follows Paul's um, line of argument through that letter where he says that we are seated with him. Now, reason would suggest that of those three, sit, walk, stand, which would you think is the hardest for us to do? And reason would suggest that the thing that would be the hardest would be to stand. And the next hardest would be to walk, and the easiest would be to sit. Or if you prefer it, rest. But Watchman Nee brings out the point that the sitting is actually the most difficult. That's the hardest. And the reason it's the hardest is because it goes against our activity-oriented culture. Come back to that uh, um, uh, testimony, uh, that word of personal experience that Colin shared. Lord, what do you want me to do now? Nothing. Get out of the way. But you see, if you're a minister, and most of you are, 
That is something that you and I find very, very difficult. To do nothing and allow God. Sit down. There's a chair over there, just go and sit down. And allow me to do it, says God, the Holy Spirit. Well, Lord, I need to be up here to make sure that something doesn't go wrong. I need to be up here and keep control. And then we think, oh, no, no, I'm not in control, am I? God's in control. But he needs me to be around, to be at hand. In that commentary, and you may know it, and if you've read it, you know the quote, and I, 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 I'm afraid it comes out quite often when I'm speaking on this theme. Um, and I never thought about it before, and it comes out in Watchman Nee's commentary. Why do you think... God made man on day six and didn't make man on day one. Because man is the highest, he's the culmination of his creation. So why didn't he start with the best? Well, you can think of all sorts of explanations. The Bible doesn't give us the answer. So your theory is as good as mine, as good as Watchman Nee's. But I like Watchman Nee's and it ties in with what I'm sharing. If God had made man on day one, on day two, man would have said to God, what can I do to help? How can I assist you? And God knew that that's what man would say to him. And God did not want man to be a pain in the neck for a week. So God left him till day six. And what did God do on day seven? He rested. Isn't God frustrating? And I have no idea whether that's the reason, but it's fascinating, and it certainly ties in with much of what God is saying to us. What can I do to help? God, what can I do to assist you in your work? Lord, we're extending the kingdom. No, we're not. I'm extending the kingdom. Get out of the way. One of my heroes, and maybe um, the hero of some of you as well, is Martin Luther. He's one of these guys who uh, has so much to teach us about the Christian life and the Christian walk in the experience that he went, to, went through. Uh, a man who stood up against the, um, the, the, the mighty Roman Catholic Church, the church of the day, uh, and at various points in his life and various points as he went through all that he went through, he, he, you know, the enemy threw at him from time to time that, that fiery dart. How on earth do you think you're right and everybody else is wrong? And he was a man who went through it. And some of you will know his testimony, um, books like Here I Stand and other biographies. And Martin Luther, he, um, of course, um, he was in the, in the Catholic Church and he was a monk. And all the time he was reaching out, trying to get right with God. And he did all the things that they did in those days. Um, he ate, not, not, not only did he eat simple food, he ate rotten food. I mean, if it smelt nice or it looked tasty, he would reject it. If it wasn't vermin-ridden, he would reject it. And he wore clothes. I mean, if they were clean and, and freshly laundered, not for me. He would wear clothes, again, that were covered in dirt and muck and vermin and all the rest of it. He slept on a cell that was running with rats and dampness. I'd be, you can go to Wittenberg and see it. Uh, the cell, I mean, these days, of course, it's all beautifully scrubbed and clean and antiseptic and all the rest of it, and surrounded by tourists with their Japanese cameras taking pictures of it. I mean, it, born, it bears no resemblance to what it was like when Luther lived there. And he had this little whip, I can't remember the name of it at the moment, he had this little whip with the various sort of uh, strands to it, and embedded in the strands with these tiny little bits of flint, and he would beat himself so that his back was running in blood, and he, you know, he deprived himself of sleep and all the rest of it. And all the time he was seeking to get right with God. And at one point he was ordained, maybe that's the route I'll take. 
And some of you will know the story how, as he read the book of Romans, particularly chapters 6, 7, and 8, crying out to God, what must I do to be saved? What do I have to do? What is the work that I have to do? What is the activity that I have to do? As Dan was talking this morning, you know, how many hours do I have to pray? How much do I have to fast? What on earth do I have to do? And reading Romans 6, 7, and 8, finally it got through to him, nothing. Because it's done. It's done. And of course it came like, a, you know, I mean, it's silly, isn't it, to say it came like a bolt out of the blue. I mean, that's an understatement. It hit him like a sledgehammer. It's like Paul on the Damascus Road. Uh, Paul uh, and Colin was talking, uh, preaching about this to the uh, students and the team um, last week. Um, Paul on the Damascus Road, as uh, he hears, you know, he hears the voice and he sees the light, and he's aware that it's God, but he doesn't know who it is. And he calls out, "Who are you, Lord?" And the word is, "I am Jesus." Pow! It hit him in the guts because he realized he'd been wrong. And it's that sort of experience that Luther went through. I remember my father, he was, um, he, he died several years ago, and um, uh, before he died, I believe he gave his life to the Lord. I believe his profession was a saving profession, but God alone can make that judgment. But he was one of these, um, what I would call an old-fashioned Victorian gentleman, you know, God helps those who help themselves. And, you know, he was fond of these sort of Victorian pithy sayings, some of which have some truth, you know, look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves, all these sort of sayings. And one of his favorite ones was, God will help those who help themselves. And, of course, it's totally unchristian. The gospel is God helps those who come to realize they can't help themselves. That is the gospel. And my father, he and I had many a discussion. And, uh, I mean, he didn't literally try and buy his way to heaven, but he was quite a, he was quite a well-to-do man. And, uh, you know, from time to time, uh, there was the temptation, maybe I can, uh, you know, what can I contribute? I remember Dick Lucas, a minister in St. Helens Bishopsgate in the city, gets many wealthy people, stockbrokers and the like, if there are any left these days, um, you know, coming into his office, into his vestry, and they get out their checkbook. They want to make a contribution, and he says, put your money away. What God wants is you. And it's such an impact, a clergyman turning away money. <laughs> what can I do? Nothing. Nothing. It's been accomplished. All you have to do is sit. You see, the paradox of the Christian faith is that it begins with a big done, not a big do. And you see, most of us are looking for that big do. We say, what do I have to do to be right with God? I mean, it's what Dan was sharing this morning. What do I have to do to have power in my ministry? I mean, we're all looking for power in our ministry. Everybody wants to be powerful. Everybody in the world wants to be powerful, but we want to be powerful. But what is the secret of power? Well, Paul says it many times. It's in weakness. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. It's Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And the prophet was speaking to a people who had returned from exile. They come back to Jerusalem. They had these two mega building projects on, the temple and the walls. And they'd marshaled all the craftsmen. They'd marshaled all the materials. They'd marshaled all the skills that they needed to complete these wonderful projects. And God says, stop. What do you think you're doing? 
We're building the walls. We're building the temple. Look at these magnificent stones. Look at this wonderful timber. Look at that skilled craftsman over there. And God says, that is not the way it's done. The way it's done is by my spirit. Not by your skill or your strength or your money. It's by my spirit. And this is the theme, you see, that comes through the Bible time and time and time again, which Christians, and particularly ministers, have to learn so often. What is the secret, if one can put it this way, of successful ministry? And you see, most of us come on conferences, maybe that's why some of us are here. We're looking for the latest technique. Where is the button? Just show me where it is and I'll press it. You know, even in my own life. I'm sure all of us in some measure and maybe many times we've sat down to and, 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 and spoken to people who've come to us and said it. You know, you know, what's wrong with my life? Show me the sin and I'll repent of it. We'll get it dealt with. And then whoopee, we'll be off. Where's the button? Let me press it. And you see, that's not what the Bible is saying. You see, the natural reason says, show me the goal and I'll walk there. I'll, I'll get there. God's truth is, we are already there. We are already there. We have what we need. So what do we do? We rest in what we have got. We sit in what we have got. And when we are sitting or resting in what we have got, then we can begin to walk in what we have got. And when we are walking in what we have got, then we can stand in what we have got. But you see, so often, most of us miss out the sitting or the resting bit. Now, this isn't, of course, uh, an exercise in passivity. And again, this is what Dan was sharing this morning. I suppose in one sense, I'm just saying the same message again but I'm approaching it from a different angle and a different emphasis, but essentially it's the same thing. It's not an exercise in passivity, but it's an exercise in coming to the Bible, coming into fellowship, coming into conferences like this, coming into that place of walking with God in prayer, where constantly God is ministering to us what he has already done and what he has already given us. So what do we do with it? Well, in one sense, we don't do anything with it. We rest in it and just sit and just be. And of course, you see, our, our activity-oriented culture is constantly saying to us, stop being and start doing. Uh, uh, an illustration, I'm not, I mean, it may come in uh, Watchman Nee's commentary as well. I'm not quite sure I got this from. But it, it's a bit like a, a, a drowning person. And some of you may have had the experience of trying to save somebody who is drowning. And in their situation of desperation and probable panic, they're thrashing around, uh, trying to find something that they can hang on to, trying to find some bit of wood or something that they can cling on to, to save themselves. And you swim out to them, and there they are thrashing around in their panic and their desperation, and you know, reason, that they, reason is gone and, and, and all the rest of it. And they are actually as much danger to you um, because they could hit you and, you know, do some damage to, do, to you. So what do you do in that situation? 
Well, you can do one of two things. Firstly, you can look for a gap between their flaming, ar their flaily, not flaming, their flailing arms, and you can go up and belt them one. <laughs> the other thing you can do, if you feel that's a little bit unchristian, um, the other thing you can do is you can just swim slowly round in circles until they stop all this thrashing around. And when then they stop thrashing around and trying to help themselves, then you can go in and help them. Very difficult to save somebody who is struggling, arms and legs and, you know, going in all directions. They're, they're dangerous to you. I mean, it's probably obvious to you that I've never had any training whatsoever as a lifeguard. And I've no idea what you do in that sort of situation, but I know what I would do. I would belt them one. <laughs> <clears throat> or I would just wait till they're, they're virtually drowned. And then you can just get hold of them like a lump of meat and just drag them to the sh shore and pump them out. And there's a sense in which God does that with us. I mean, don't press the analogy too far. But there's a sense, you see, in which in our... And I suppose desperation may be the right word. In our desperation, you know, to find that power, to find that dynamic, to find that wonderful ministry that we're reaching out for, here we are thrashing around. And what does God do? He comes along and belts us. Well, you can smile at it. I mean, pretty much did that with Paul. I mean, if that's not a belt in the guts, I don't know what is. I mean, the rich young ruler, he belted him, not physically. But I mean, sell everything and get, you have and give to the poor. I mean, that's, that's a pretty knockout blow, particularly if you're rich. I mean, if you haven't got anything, that's not much of a challenge to you. But if you're rich and God says to you, sell everything and give to the poor, that's, you know, that's one in the guts. And he was a man who was, who, who was, I mean, I don't know whether he was desperate, you can use that word of him, but he was certainly reaching out for God. And some people see in the Apostle Paul's life, you know, in his desperation, the, in Acts 9, we won't take time to turn to it, but in Acts 9, it, you know, it talks about him really going for this persecution. I mean, there was almost something, you, you, you know, almost something demonic in him. You know, hitting out in all directions to eradicate this pernicious evil called Christianity. Well, God belted in one. And God does do that sometimes. Uh, in his dealings with his people. And he gives us a whammy. And it might take various forms. It might take the form of health. It might take the form of relationships. It might take the form of, of, of finances. It might take the form of a job. It might take any form. But God gives us a real whammy. And sometimes he gives us a double whammy. Because you don't hear the first one. But sometimes he just swims slowly around in circles until we come to the point of desperation. And that might take months, it might even take years, until we turn around to God and we say, God, I am really desperate now and all I can do is rely on you. And God says, at last you got there. You see, we say this to one another sometimes and people say it to us. You know, pastor, vicar, elder, whatever position you're in, you know, I'm desperate. I've tried this, I've tried that. I suppose all I can do now is rely on God. And you see, they say it as if, it, as if it's the dregs. They say it as if, you know, isn't it terrible? All I can do now is rely on God. You know, aren't I in a terrible situation? The truth is, of course, you are in the most wonderful situation. Because if you've actually got to that point where you can say, all I can do now is rely on God, God says, at last you've got there, now we can begin to do something. 
Some of you will know the uh, writings of uh, Neil Anderson. And um, in his, uh, one of his books, uh, I think it's uh, Escape from Darkness, he has this uh, section entitled, You Can't Live Beyond What You Believe. You can't live beyond what you believe. A right behavior ha pattern is based on right belief. And wrong belief leads to wrong behavior. Some of you will know that, but let me just repeat it. A right behavior pattern is based on right belief. You see, we're all looking for that, that fruitfulness, that power, that wonderful ministry, that wonderful behavior that's going to make people go, wow! God's moving in that place. Now, God wants that. That's not the flesh. You see, God has actually promised us abundant life. I mean, sometimes people don't really, you know, they, you know, we, particularly in this country, you have a certain mentality of Christianity and, and Christian churches that they're supposed to be down at heel and tatty. Now, we have some people sometimes come into Roffey Place and they, you know, they sort of wrinkle their nose when they walk in because it's too smart. You know, because we have this certain expectation that Christian ministers should be down at, teal, uh, down at heel and tatty, driving down at heel and tatty cars with down at heel and tatty homes and down at heel and tatty wives. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I'll share it. We were at a meeting the other day. I won't um, <laughs> tell you where it was. But June, we came away from it, and June said to me, Christian women in this country, they don't wear very well. It came out in the women's conference that we had here quite recently. Um, and it says something about what God is, or rather he isn't doing. I mean, I didn't intend to talk about this. It's really going off at a tangent. But you see... God wants us to have that abundant life. He wants us to be successful. I mean, Colin stood up here and, um, and was it this morning? I can't remember. And said, you know, oh, yeah, that's right, at the beginning of the prayer meeting, he said, come we'll all come together. I don't like preaching to empty chairs. In my first parish, when I was first ordained 30 years ago as a, as a curate in the Anglican Church, it was a church in the, in the centre of London, just north of Oxford Street, uh, just behind Selfridges, and there were these um, uh, sort of pillars with, uh, with cross members uh, down the side of the church, and it was a most peculiar architectural construction, and I, I sort of commented on this to one of the church wardens and said, why are these here? And he said, oh, well, a previous vicar, we used to have galleries around the church, but the previous vicar took them out because he, wasn't, he refused to preach to empty chairs. Well, you can take the chairs out or you can fill them. God wants our churches to be full. He wants us to have a sense of expectation that they are full. We have a mentality in this country where we assume that it's normal to be struggling. Somebody once said the definition of a cathedral is an ancient ecclesiastical building with a thermometer outside. <laughs> it's a denial of the power of the gospel. Now, where does this behavior, where does this fruit come from, it comes from belief. The right behavior pattern comes from right belief. And if there isn't the right behavior, or if you like the right fruit, or the right activity, what is wrong? It's the belief pattern which is deficient. Now religion says, it's our techniques which are deficient. And therefore we go to a conference to improve our techniques. But it's not our techniques that are deficient, it's our belief that is deficient because it's not our job that we're doing. 
It's God's job. God to Jehoshaphat. The battle is not yours. You're praying for somebody to be healed. You can't heal them. You know you can't heal them, but there you are desperately shaking away your hand over them. And you see, what does God tell us to do? He doesn't tell us to go to a healing conference to improve our technique. What he tells us to do is to come to a revival conference to improve our belief in what he can do. And you see the message that God is just emphasizing all the way through this conference. Come back to uh, Neil Anderson. Um, he asked the question, assuming my goals are of God, and, uh, you know, I'm making that assumption, and he's making that assumption in his book. The question we need to ask are, are our plans to achieve those goals his plans or our soulish activity? One of the questions that I sometimes ask a pastor or a church counsel as I travel around and speak in a church is, what are your goals for the coming year? It's good to have goals. I think as Plato once said, if you don't aim at anything, you're likely to hit it. Or I think it's more accurate to say, if you aim at nothing, you're likely to hit it. Nothing. That's what you'll hit. So it's good to have goals. God has goals. And we need to find out not only what, how, what his goals are, but also how he wants to achieve those goals. So it's good to sit down and say to the Lord, what are our goals? Our goals are to fill this church Sunday by Sunday. When we do that Sunday by Sunday, then our goals are to fill it twice Sunday by Sunday, and so on. Dan was sharing this the other night, and then we can fill it every night of the week, and I don't know what the figure he quoted, 25,000 or something, through this building in a week. Goals. It's good to have goals. The question is, what are our plans to achieve those goals? Because, you see, what we can do is enter in to all sorts of soulish activity. A pastor, a youth pastor, wants a strong youth group in his church. Uh, parents want obedient children, and so on. And we have all these goals, but you see, the question comes, and this is where the crunch comes, what do we do when our goals aren't being achieved? What is our, if you like, our emotional reaction? Well, Neil Anderson in his book, he talks about various things. We can have anger, we can have anxiety, we can have depression, we can be resentful, and so on. Now, if you allow the enemy to feed you with those wrong um, emotions, this, in turn, leads to a wrong response. And it's what Neil Anderson calls, in one of his books, power mode. And, you know, a church will sit down in their council, whatever the form that council takes, PCC, Board of Deacons, whatever it is, and they will say, well, our goal, because it's one of our goals, so I'll mention it, our goal is to see 30 people converted every week. That's one of our goals here currently in this church. We're not reaching that yet. We're not seeing, I don't know what the figure is, but we're falling short of that figure. It's a figure we believe God gave us. 30 new converts every week. So the evangelism department sits down and says, right, now what are our plans to achieve that? So we think, right, well, we'll do this, and we'll do that, and we'll do that, and we'll do that, and we'll do the other. That is our, those are our plans to achieve that goal. So we do this. And then we do that, and then we do the other, and so on. And we're still at 20 a week. So we get frustrated, and we get anxious, and maybe we get embarrassed, because we've stood up and said to the people, we're going to achieve 30 a week. So we've tried plan A, so we try plan B. And plan B says we do this, and this, and this, and so on. 
and we're still at 20 so we try plan C and we work all the way to around to plan Z and we still are not reaching 30 a week so we try plan A again and so many churches are in that mold and it's what Neil Anderson calls in his book power mode human soulish activity what is the answer well, it sounds a bit trite, but let's just hear the principle. How we work out out in detail, of course, will vary from one situation to another. What do we do? Sit down. You see, the fruit or the behavior comes from belief. It doesn't come from activity. That doesn't mean to say we're passive, but what is the primary activity? The primary activity is come to that point of faith. Now you see some of those uh, techniques that we can learn, you know, there'll be some measure of success. But if we base our lives on these techniques, and certainly if we base our ministry on these techniques, we're gonna have some success, and one year it's gonna to seem to go well, and another year it's not gonna go so well. And, you know, we're going to have ups and downs. And one year we're going to be 20 a week and we're going to think, great, that's going well. And we're going to be encouraged. Next year it's going to be 19 a week. And we're going to get depressed. And next year it's going to be 21 a week and we'll think, boys, we're off now. And the following year it's going to be 15 a week. And we're back into depression. And many ministers are in this sort of yo-yo situation. They're ups and downs. They're happy one moment, they're angry the next. One moment they're fulfilled, the next moment they're frustrated. And why are they frustrated? Because they cannot control the situation. You see, we want to be in control. The illustration, the end of the meeting, Lord, what do you want me to do? Nothing, go and sit down. But Lord, I'm the leader of the meeting. I'm supposed to be up here. Go and sit down. Now this doesn't take away, I, I mean, don't misunderstand me here. I'm not trying to take away the, the proper role of a leader in a meeting and all the rest of it. Um, I'm not trying to undermine that or say that, you know, if you're leading a meeting, you can just do it just as well sitting at the back. I don't believe that's true, but you, you, know, you understand the principle that I'm trying to put across. It's to stand back and allow God, and allow God to say, I am in control of this situation. You're praying for somebody who is sick, I am in control of this situation. I prayed, I'll just share a word of testimony, I didn't intend to, but um, some of you may have noticed that uh, we had a time of ministry last night and the man came forward uh, in a wheelchair and um, people were going down in the spirit and of course you can't go, can't fall backwards in a wheelchair. I suppose the wheelchair can go over, I've seen that happen. It's happened here. Um, but it's a different sort of situation and I prayed for that man. I didn't have any particular word for him, uh, but uh, I can't remember now exactly what I did pray for him. But I just laid hands on him and, uh, and uh, you know, Lord, I speak your blessing over this man. I speak your Holy Spirit over this man. I didn't pray for any healing or anything like that. The man, uh, some of you may have see, seen it, he, his, his body went boom, rigid, and began to shake quite violently. Uh, his legs are, are very um, badly paralyzed, and his hands are, are you know, they're not uh, um, properly formed and so on. Uh, somebody who's very, uh, you know, incapacitated. And his body went boom, just like that. And it began to shake quite violently. And I thought, wow, what's happening here? I mean, my immediate reaction was, boys, are we going to see an empty wheelchair at the end of this meeting? And wouldn't that be tremendous? And I began to get excited and think, boys, isn't that going to be great? And everybody's going to be focused on what is happening here. And there am I, right at the center of it. All these sorts of human reactions. Um, 
And of course, I just had to, you know, just had to leave it to the Lord. Just have to leave it to God. It's not my problem. That may seem a bit hard pastorally. And that's why, obviously, one needs to be careful. One needs to be loving and sensitive and caring in that situation. And love the guy. But I don't know what was going on in his body. Uh, he went out in his wheelchair, and we didn't see last night an empty wheelchair. It would have been fantastic, of course, if we had have done. But God was certainly at work in that man's life. I don't know what was going on. But it's not my business to know what's going on. I can't read the mind of God, and I'm not supposed to read the mind of God. Only God can read his own mind, because God is God, and I'm not God. Uh, and in that situation, I had to stand back after a few moments. You know, as I say, my immediate thought was, boys, you know, is tonight we're going to see an empty chair this evening. Wow. And there am I at the center of it. And it came to a point where I just had to stand back and say, well, Lord, you know what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing, but obviously something's going on. And you see, power mode would say, right, pray more fervently. Shake more violently, you know. Out wimba wimba. Um, where's the oil? You know, what's the latest technique? Look it up in the book and see what so-and-so has to say. The latest method of healing. But you see, you and I know that's ridiculous because the Lord is the Lord. And it's not my battle. His body is not my battle. This church is not our battle. As we say constantly, that doesn't mean to say that uh, we're to just become passive and slide into a sort of inertia, but to trust God. And you see, when you're in that situation of sitting in him and just having that right belief pattern, then you can begin to walk with him. But you see, if we're not sitting in him, then our walk is based on a false foundation. And you see, I can't stand <coughs> until I'm walking, but I can't walk until I'm sitting. And it's something that we constantly need to learn in our ministry. And Paul needs to, to learn that constantly. And this is why he says, I mean, the, the classic passage uh, book is, and we don't have time to go through it, of course, is 2 Corinthians. And various times Paul makes the point that it's in my weakness that his strength comes through. And that final chapter, chapter 12, where he talks about the thorn in the flesh. And three times I plead with the Lord to take it away, but God says, no, you need to continually learn my grace is sufficient in your weakness. So what do I need to do in my weakness? Trust in his grace, which is what we've been hearing all this time. Seems like a Seems like two weeks, it's only a couple of days. It's the same in all the stories. Joshua walking around Jericho. Lord, what do you want me to do? Just go for a walk. And then blow your trumpet. That's all. Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles 20. Lord, what do you want me to do? Just go for a walk and send the choir out singing the praises of God first. Trust me. The, big, the Christian life is a big done. It's not a big do. Now, I just want to leave you with uh, three lines. And if I can ask um, uh, Colin uh, to put them up on the board.
God's work, our work, and outworking. God's work, our work, and outworking. Now, the bottom line, outworking, is the behavior, is the activity, is the fruit, is the demonstrations of power, is the healings, of the miracles. All that we want to see in our ministry, a growing church, 30 a week, one for the Lord, 40 a week, 50, 60, 100 a week, one for the Lord, every week. That's what we're reaching out for, that's what we're looking for. A mega church, a big church, a church that will impact the world that will impact society. This is the thing, you see, the whole concept, the whole dynamic of revival is not just what God does in the church, but what God does through the church to society. And the world needs to be impacted. I think it was Colin sharing it on the opening night, these headlines that we see so often about the church, the world laughs. The world thinks the church is a joke. And we long to, we know the church isn't a joke, we know God isn't a joke, we know the gospel isn't a joke. And we long to see that, that situation where, the, where there is that full flood of revival taking place in the people of God that is going to hit society in the guts. That the world is going to say, what on earth is happening there? and they come flocking to find out. And they see empty wheelchairs and crutches and people delivered and people healed and marriages restored and children reconciled with their parents and so on. It's all the outworking and we long to see that. Now we know that we can't achieve that. So how is it achieved? Now you see, what we tend to do is we won't tend to work backwards one line and we go to our activity. And so we learn, we study, we find out the latest technique, we find out which button to press. It's like Luther, what do I have to do? Is it prayer for one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours? How many hours before breakfast? Is it this or that or the other? What button do I put? Tell me, God, what I have to do. And of course, God says to us, it is not your work, it is my work. It is my work. And you see, it is that step. You see, we want to be on the third line. And we just wanted, you know, I mean, wouldn't it be lovely? Wouldn't it be fantastic? We didn't have to do anything. We just sat here and waited for people to flock through the door. And the world come, the TV cameras and the, and the papers, they just come seeing the outworking. Well, we know we have to do something. So we work back a stage and we look at our work. And that's what Neil Anderson calls power mode. What the Bible says is you have to go back to the work of God. And you have to realize what God has done and what God is doing and the power that is available from God, Zechariah 4, 6. Not by your activity, it is by my Holy Spirit. So we have to come right back to the work of God. So what do we do in line two? All you have to do, Jesus says, the Bible tells us, is have faith in what he has done. And this is what God is saying to us time and time and time again. It doesn't, didn't, it doesn't take away from, you know, that there are techniques of evangelism, and there are methods of evangelism, and there are things that we need to learn in the Christian life. Of course there are. But at the end of the day, ultimately, all that God is saying is rest in me. The Christian life is not a big do, it's a big done. So what do we do? We rest in what he has done. And when we're resting in what he has done, then we're going to see the outworking. You see, God's work, if you like, you could put alongside there the Spirit. But what do we do? We try and operate on line two and line three. And what is that? Well, in a sense, that's what Paul calls the flesh. And so much of what we do is the flesh. It's soulish. 
And so much of what we do when we realize our mistake is we try and combine the work of God, the spirit, with the soulish. And it's the soulish that has to die. It's our power mode, if you like, our work that has to die. It's not that we're inertia, uh, uh, it's not that we're passive or we, we slide into inertia, it's that we just simply have to trust God. And you see, in a few months' time, um, when the new students arrive in October for a year, they are going to get a term of this And we're going to take them through Colin's book, In Christ Jesus, covers much the same material as Neil Anderson's book, Is It Escape from Darkness? Um, they cover much the same material. And we're going to take the students through that for 10 weeks. They will get other things, of course they will. But for 10 weeks, that's the kernel of that term's teaching. Because unless they get a hold of that, unless they really grasp that, unless they really take it on board and it's part of their life, there's no point whatsoever in them going any further. If they haven't grasped it in term one, then we need to repeat it in term two. And if they haven't grasped it in term two, then we need to repeat it in term three until they have got it. And of course, so many Christian ministers, they need to get it needs to be part of their, of, of their thinking, part of their very being. That we sit and rest in what God has accomplished. We sit and rest in him. And everything else dies. And you see, when everything else is dead, then God can begin to work. And it's that dying, of course, which is that, that, that exercise of faith. And of course, when you get God's work plus faith, then you get an outworking which is going to impact the world. So why don't we get that outworking which impacts the world? Why isn't it happening? Why isn't Horsham flocking to these doors or to the doors of your church? Well, we know that God's work isn't deficient because it's God's work and nothing God does is deficient. So somewhere along the line, between God's work and the outworking, there is a barrier, there's a hindrance. And that, of course, is you and me. You and me individually, us corporately, the church. And of course, it's when the church stands back and says to God, I trust you. You don't have to do it. Then we're going to see an outworking of God. Not of us, but of God. And that's what's going to impact the world. Now, I've probably shared nothing new to you this afternoon. Uh, many of you, probably, maybe all of you, have read Colin's book, In Christ Jesus, or some of Neil Anderson's stuff. But as I was thinking uh, this morning, and when Dan was talking, I, I just felt that what we needed to share this afternoon just needed to flow, this teaching just needed to flow with the challenge of what God was presenting to us. Uh, during this conference. And so I make no apology if what I've shared with you is old stuff. Maybe you've been preaching it and teaching it to your own people. I pray you have. But from time to time, it's important to come back to these basic principles. And you see, all we've been speaking about is sitting. Sitting. And you see, if we get that right, then we can start walking. And you see, it's those who are walking with God who will stand when the church starts throwing bricks at us, which it will surely do, and more than bricks. 
And God wants a people in that situation who will stand for him and be mighty for him. If those figures are correct, 250,000 people are dying a year for Jesus. I have to admit, I scarcely can believe that. But that's what the figure, the guys who, who research these things, that's the figure they come up with. Wow. They are making a stand. It's like Hebrews 11. And you see, why could those, guy, those men and women be in Hebrews 11? Why could they be there? Because they stood for Christ. But why could they stand for Christ? Because they trusted in him. And that's why Hebrews 11 begins, begins as it does, with the whole dynamic of faith. Because that's the key, that's the essence. Well, we must stop there. We won't try and have a a time of ministry because I believe God is going to minister to us this evening and uh, I don't believe it's essential that we should try and have a ministry at every occasion but let's just uh, let's just stand to pray together Heavenly Father we thank you for all that has been accomplished through Jesus for all that has been accomplished through the cross. Father, we thank you that that sacrifice was total, it was complete, it was sufficient. And Father, we thank you that you call us to rest in that by faith, with thanksgiving. And so, Father, we come to you afresh now and we say to you, we just, we just put to death all that soulish activity in our ministry. Father, we surrender our ministries afresh to you and we say to you, we stand back and we allow you. And so, Father, we thank you that as we do that, we will see that mighty outworking of your Holy Spirit in power in the world that will bring glory to your name and see your kingdom extended and your church built. So, Father, we pray that you'll continue to minister into our lives. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing in these days. Father, we thank you that you've called us to be part of it. Father, we thank you that you've called us to be people of faith. Father, we thank you that you've called us to trust in that big done. And this we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll break there.